Hi, this is Jason Freeman again, professor and chair of the School of Music at Georgia Tech, with the second video in my series on learning sound synthesis with VCV Rack. Once again, I encourage you to learn more about the School of Music, including our degree programs in music technology, our groundbreaking music technology research, and music opportunities that we offer to all Georgia Tech students by looking at the video in this series that goes into these items in more detail, and also by looking at the School of Music's website at music.gatech. Edu. In this video, we'll focus on generating and manipulating sound. We'll look at using oscillators and the waveforms that they, uh, that they employ. We'll look at filtering sound using low-pass and high-pass filters. We'll look at changing the amplitude of sound using ADSR envelopes. And we'll look at creating more modules and connecting them together to make more complex sounds. Before we get to that though, I briefly want to talk about how we not only listen to sound in order to design it, but also how we look at it. Now in the first video, we already used this scope that you see on the left here to look at sound as it was being generated. This scope shows us a waveform display of sound where we have time on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. But there's another tool that makes it really uh, uh, easy to understand the timbres and the components of sound that we're looking at. That's a spectral analyzer. Uh, and that's what we see on the right here. And that shows not time at all, in fact, but it shows frequency on our x-axis, which is measured in hertz here, 100 hertz, 1,000 hertz, 10,000 hertz. And then it shows intensity in decibels on the y-axis. So this gives you a much clearer picture of what is happening with different frequency components, different timbral components of a sound and how they change. In order to install this analyzer component in your installation of VCV Rack, it will take a minute and it's a little bit tedious, but it is well worth the time. Uh, what you'll need to do is go to, into the library menu in the VCV Rack software and follow the instructions to create a VCV Rack account and to log in with it. Once you've done that, in this, that same library menu, you'll click on Manage Plugins, which will open a website where you can search for plugins to add to VCV Rack. You want to search for the words BOG Audio, that's the library that we want to install on the library web page. That will turn up search results similar to what you see at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a bunch of uh, uh, plus signs with words saying subscribe to BOG Audio next to it. Click on any one of those, it doesn't matter which, any of those are sufficient to install the BOG Audio library on your account. Uh, and Once you've done that, you can go back to VCV Rack. Click in that same library menu to update your plugins, and then it will prompt you to quit VCV Rack and relaunch it in order to complete the installation of those plugins. Now, once you've done all of that, uh, you can go back into VCV Rack, and now I'll show you how you can add uh, any plugin that you want uh, into your rack, such as the Bog Audio Analyzer. I'm going to position my mouse in any empty spot, press the Enter key on my keyboard, and that takes me to a menu that shows me all the plugins that are available. These are some of the default ones that come with VCV Rack. If I go and click on Bog Audio now, I'll see all the plugins that are available as part of Bog Audio. I click on the Analyzer one that we were just looking at and drag it wherever I want it to appear in my rack. It's as simple as that. So now that we've got the Analyzer plugin installed and ready to use, I want to look at oscillators and waveforms. And specifically, I want to look at the four basic waveform types that we see not only in the voltage controlled oscillator here in VCV Rack, but in most synthesizers sine waves, triangle waves, sawtooth waves, and square waves. Let's go take a look. So I'm going to simplify things a little bit here so that we don't have as much clutter in our uh, VCV Rack patch. I'm going to delete those notes. Uh, I'm going to delete the ADSR envelope and the voltage controlled filter for now so that we just have the VCO here. I'm going to disconnect that as well. I'm going to start with our sine wave. I'm going to hook up the sine wave to our scope, and you can see it looks like a sine wave. Uh, it looks exactly like a sine wave. As I lower the frequency of it, uh, the cycles of my wave become further apart, and as I increase the frequency, they become closer together. Now, if I hook that up, to the analyzer, in order to hook up this, uh, multiple chords to the same place in VCV Rack, you usually have to hold down the command or control key on your keyboard uh, while you do that. So I'm going to click and drag to make that connection. And here we can see we're just getting one frequency peak. And you see that peak goes up or down. I'm actually going to switch this from analog simulation to a digital sine wave. So I get a purer signal that really only has one peak there. And you can see, as you move the frequency, it goes up to the right or left down. Uh, but I'm always just getting one peak, which is showing me that a sine wave consists of only one frequency component. And I can hear this too if I want by hooking this back up to my mixer. I get the sine wave. Let me 
that a little quieter so it doesn't drive us crazy. Um, so as compared to a sine wave, a sawtooth wave has a lot of frequency components. Let me make that even a little bit quieter there. So a sine wave, uh, a sawtooth wave has a ton of frequency components. We can see that sawtooth wave shape in the scope. But what I'm really interested in is, is what's happening in the analyzer here. We have not just that original one that we got with the sine wave. I actually draw that in here as well. If I hook that up, you can see that in purple was my sine wave. The green is all the things we're getting with the sawtooth wave. And they are spaced apart. And each one, as we get higher and higher and higher, gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Um, these are all ha called partials, these additional frequency components, whereas this one, uh, original one is the fundamental frequency. And these happen in predictable intervals. They always happen at integer multiples of my fundamental frequency. So if my fundamental frequency were at, say, 100 hertz, my partials would be at 200 hertz and 300 hertz and 400 hertz and so on and so forth. Now, if I look at a triangle wave as compared to a sawtooth wave, I'm going to get some of those frequency components, but not all of them. And the sound is going, and they're going to decay a lot faster as well. So the sound is richer than what I would hear with just a sine wave, but it is not quite as thick as what I would hear with that sawtooth wave. What I'm getting here is every alternate partial instead of all of them. It's every other partial instead of all of them. And then if I go over to a square wave, a similar phenomenon. I'm getting every other partial, but it's all the ones that were not present in the triangle wave. Uh, the triangle wave has all the ones that the square wave does not have, and vice versa. You can also see in the scope here, we get the trademark square wave shape that you would expect. Um, so those are our four basic waveforms that you see in most synthesizers uh, and that we see in VCV rack with the VCO object. So now that we've looked at that, now that we've generated sounds, I want to go ahead and start filtering sounds uh, to kind of shape and sculpt the timbre by taking away certain frequency components. And the two most common ways to do that are with low pass and high pass filters. And there's two important ways to control those filters through their center frequency and their resonance. So again, let's take a look. I'm gonna move this back to a sawtooth wave since that gives me the richest set of frequency components. It'll be the clearest thing to, to, to look at here. So I've got my sawtooth wave and I'm gonna go ahead and add back in here, again, by pushing the enter key, then clicking on my VCV plugins and clicking VCF for voltage controlled filter, to add back in my VCF, my filter. And we're going to change how all this stuff is connected here. I'm going to disconnect everything for a minute to make sure that sawtooth wave, instead of going straight to the mixer or straight to these analyzers, it goes into my filter first. And then I'm going to let the LPF or low pass filter be my output that then goes forward into my mixer so I can hear it. And then also goes into my scope and also goes into my analyzer. And what we can see here, what we can hear, is that this is a lot thinner than what we're hearing with the full sine wave. Most of those frequency components are gone because I filtered them out. I'm only letting the lowest frequencies pass through, cutting out off everything above a certain point. By moving this frequency knob on the VCF, I'm able to raise or lower where that point is. So as I move this up, you see more of those frequency components are coming to get, coming through now. Till if I move it up to the highest level, I'll hear the original sawtooth wave. And then I can start taking them away again. My resonance here is controlling how quickly, once I get to that cutoff point, they start disappearing, or how gradual that is. Right now, it's a fairly smooth roll off. If I increase that, it's going to start coming off very suddenly. And you can kind of see where that is, and you can hear the difference in the timbre. Right here, hear that a lot more clearly. Similar thing happens if I switch from low pass filter to high pass filter. Now I'm only letting the high frequencies pass through and I'm cutting off the low ones. I can let only really high frequencies come through or I can lower that so I'm starting to get lower ones. And I can of course change that resonance as well. I can get some really weird sounds if I turn this up really high. So the final thing I want to show you is now that we've generated sound and we've filtered it, we want to change the amplitude of the sound. And sure, I can turn the knob up and down in the mixer to change the amplitude of the sound. But what I'm talking about is changing the amplitude of the sound over the course of the sound from the time I first push down the key to start a note until I release a note and it fades out to nothing. And the most common way to do this is through something called ADSR, which stands for Attack, Decay, Sustain, and Release, four stages of an envelope, which are illustrated in this diagram here. 
and we can look at attack time. How quickly do we go from silence to full volume after I uh, push down a key to start a note? That might be instantaneous or it might happen very slowly as we looked at in the first video. Then we can look at a decay time. Once we hit that maximum level, how quickly do we go down to a sustain level? And then we can look at what that sustain level is. Is it something that's very close to our full volume or is it something that's very close to silence or something in between? And then when I let go of the key to release the note, how long does it take for this to fade from the sustain level down to complete silence? Uh, so a couple important notes here. One is that as long as I keep a key down, we're gonna stay in the sustain level for forever. Uh, so the attack has a finite amount of time, decay has a finite amount of time, release has a finite amount of time. Sustain is kind of a steady state, and the length of that is determined by how long I keep the key down. Um, similarly, along with this, attack, decay, and release are measures of time, where sustain is really a measure of a percentage of that maximum volume, of that maximum kind of attack level that we get to, um, is not a measure of time. And finally, we're going to use something called a gate so that we can uh, kind of connect uh, turning on a note and turning off a note, pushing down a key, releasing a key, to starting this envelope and releasing this envelope. Let me show you more about what I mean in Rack here. We're going to go ahead and create an ADSR right there. So we put that back in. And uh, what I can do here is uh, this is not part of my signal chain the same way as the filter. So I hooked up the output of the voltage control oscillator, the sawtooth, to the input of my filter, and then the output of that to my mixer. ADSR is not actually generating sound. It's generating an envelope. It's generating what's called control voltage or control data that's controlling how something else works. And so I'm going to hook up the output of that to this control voltage input on channel one of my mixer. So it means the sound is still coming in this in one here. And this control, this envelope, is coming in on CV1. You can think of it as basically moving up and down the volume knob on channel one of the sound based on the properties of that, those four stages of the attack, decay, sustain, and release. And then in order to trigger this envelope, we want to hook it up to the gate on my MIDI, uh, my MIDI input so that that gate gets triggered, triggers the envelope when I push down the key, and it uh, releases the envelope when I lift up the key. I'm also going to go ahead and plug this volts per octave back in to control the frequency of my oscillator as well while I'm at it. So now if I turn the level back up, you won't actually hear anything because I haven't activated the envelope yet. We're still at silence. Um, I can show that a little bit more clearly here. Um, if I disconnect my scope from there, here, I'll hook that back up to the mixer though. And instead I look at the uh, output coming from the mixer is what I'm, uh, what I'm viewing in my scope and my analyzer. So you can see the level is gonna go up and down now. And so if I push a key on my keyboard now to trigger this, you should hear the sound and you should see it come up and down. Now I'll release it and it goes down and away. And as I change, say my attack, uh, decay, sustain and release. So I might want a very quick attack um, that decays slowly down to a very low sustain level, for example. And then I release it to nothing. Or maybe it decays very quickly, so it sounds like a boom kind of sound. Maybe that's too quick. I can turn that up a little bit. Uh, and maybe I want a slower release. Or maybe I want a really high sustain level. It's just a little bit lower than my full attack volume. So there's all kinds of things there that you can experiment with and try out. So now that we've looked at changing the amplitude of a sound with envelopes, the final thing I want to show you in this video is how to create more modules and connect them together using the mixer so that we can create more complex sounds. So as a starting point for that, why don't we create a second VCO, a second VCF, and a second ADSR so that we can have two sounds, two different timbres going at the same time. I'm going to clear out a little bit more space here. We're kind of finished with the scope for right now and the analyzer, so I'm going to get rid of those to clear out some more space. I'm going to go ahead and use Enter to create another VCO. I'll put it right down there underneath the first one. We'll make another VCF, and I'll make another ADSR. And then I'll hook up my volts per octave, again, holding down Control or Command, so I can hook this up to multiple things. Hook that up to volts per octave on my second one. I'll go ahead and hook up gate to my second uh, ADSR. 
and I'll hook up this signal path. Maybe instead of a sawtooth wave on this one, I'll do a square wave. So I'll hook that up there. Maybe instead of a high pass filter, I'll do a low pass filter. So I'll plug that into channel two. And then I'll hook up my uh, ADSR envelope to the CV on channel two. So now I can play both sounds. And you can kind of hear both of them. But what might be really interesting is if I transpose my second uh, uh, kind of signal chain down here. So it's at a higher or lower pitch than the first one by moving my frequency knob. And since the square wave doesn't cut through as much as the sawtooth wave, maybe I'll make the sawtooth wave quieter here by bringing that level down. And then maybe I'll change the resonance here a little bit increase my frequency on my filter as well and uh, maybe change this so this has a slower attack uh, a lower sustain level uh, a quick release but a really long decay so i have different uh, uh signal chains my top one kind of coming through more at certain points and my lower one coming down at other points uh, I'd encourage you to build upon this idea and have not just two different chains here, but have four. Use all four channels of this mixer. Have four very different sounds, timbres, pitches coming through um, that you control through, uh, through your uh, computer keyboard. So to review what we've done now in this video, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. We've looked at how to look at sound as waveforms, how different uh, types of basic waveforms are different from each other, uh, and how we can understand those by looking not just at the waveform view and the scope, but also at the, that spectral view in the analyzer. Um, how we use VCO to generate those four different kinds of waveforms with different timbral properties to them. How we then further shape the timbres of those sounds using low pass and high pass filters with different frequencies and resonances. And how we change their amplitudes over time using ADSR envelopes. And then how we can create multiple signal chains with oscillators, filters, and ADSR envelopes and then mix them together um, to create even more complex sounds. In the next video, we're going to take this all to another level by looking at not just how we use envelopes to change sounds over time, but how we can use modulation synthesis techniques, low frequency oscillators to change sounds and other properties over time, not just amplitude. Also how we use amplitude modulation and frequency modulation to carry those new principles to logical extremes where they actually create dramatically new kinds of timbres.